Well, good morning. And we want to welcome you to the Indiana Clean School Bus Consortium webinar. My name is Carl Lissick, Director with Drive Clean Indiana, and the Drive Clean Indiana team will be acting as your host and administrative sponsor for this and all upcoming Indiana Clean School Bus Consortium events. We have a great webinar today and, and some wonderful news to share about the grant program currently out through US EPA and how you can start planning. So let's uh, review the agenda. So uh, today uh, we're just gonna go through some welcome and housekeeping and then Carter Granberg and Tony Maeda from US EPA are gonna review the grant and the NOFA uh, that's currently out from US EPA. Uh, Ryan Lissick will provide some information on grant assistance. And then at the end, we'll have a question and answer period. So um, we would also like to uh, talk to you about uh, keeping yourself muted throughout the meeting. Uh, we will begin everyone in the mute mode without cameras, but we'll open it up during the question and answer time. You'll be able to type in any of your questions and we will get to as many questions as we can. If we don't get to your question, we will provide you with an email answer. Today's presentation will be about 30 to 45 minutes followed by questions and answers, as well as a short survey. We would ask all of our participants to take the short survey. If you have any additional questions, you can be email those to info at drivecleanindiana.org. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the Drive Clean Indiana website. All the upcoming announcements, including events, grants, projects, or pertinent information will be on our website. If you have any questions, you can call us at 219-644-3690. And so I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what the Indiana Clean School Bus Consortium is. It's a collaboration of federal, state, and local agencies and concerned citizens, along with communities, nonprofit organizations, and private companies, all working together to make a visible difference in our communities by reducing exposure to emissions from school bus diesel engines and equipment. Our goal also is to highlight the great products and technologies being implemented in our state and throughout the United States and provide you with resources that will assist you in learning about these new technologies. This includes health concerns, peer-to-peer -peer interaction, overviews and demonstrations of these technologies, as well as best management practices. We also want to understand what information you'd like to learn about, and we would uh, create upcoming webinars based on the feedback we receive from you. Our goal is also selfish. We want all of our schools applying for upcoming funding opportunities that will reduce barriers to the transition to cleaner school bus technologies. So this is your, our consortium created for clean Indiana school buses. With that being said, our Drive Clean Indiana team is here to answer and be of service to you and your schools. And we look forward to working with all of you. If you have a question, please place that in the chat. So, uh, well, again, I wanted to thank you all for participating and we look forward to a great webinar. So um, I would like to introduce now uh, Carter Granberg and Tony Maeda from US EPA. Tony and Carter. Hey, thanks, Carl. Um, what I'm gonna do is try to get my screen sharing going. Can you pass that back to me? Yes, give me one second. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm, I'm Tony Maeda. Um, Thank you for passing that to me. And as I'm setting up my screen sharing, I am going to hopefully can everyone see can everyone see my slides? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. I, I, I pressed the button really too fast. So Carter Cranberg is the Indiana State Coalition lead from EPA Region 5. There's a whole group of us working on the Clean School Bus program. Um, for any of the schools who are around who may have heard of the National Clean Diesel Campaign or the Midwest Clean Diesel Initiative, I've been working on that since about 2008. And so those are like your regularly scheduled clean diesel grants that EPA has been giving out for many years with congressional funding. Um, and that program is still ongoing. Um, but for, for this clean school bus program, we're kind of taking the same approach and having state by state groups. So you are in the right place if you're from Indiana, you're in the Indiana State Clean Clean School Bus Coalition, uh, you're, you're with the coalition right now. And so Carter's been on vacation, and so he and I are gonna kind of split up a little bit of talking about the current grant opportunity that's open right now for the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Clean School Bus Program. And just to give you all a, a 10,000 foot overview, this is one of two programs that is gonna be is open for the year. Um, the, the rebate program, which is what we had last year, uh, there was no grant program last year, just the rebates. 
that rebate program is going to open up again in the fall. And so um, I'm going to actually kind of start off with a little bit of the difference between those two programs, okay? So there's a billion dollars a year that um, has been given to EPA by Congress. And last year, the rebate program, that's all we ran. And so EPA spent that entire $1 billion um, in just that, that rebate program. But this year, you're looking at $400 million for this grant program that's open right now. And then there'll be about $600 million available for rebates in the fall. And so, um, Really quickly, I want to give you just a, a little bit of an overview here. It's you want to apply for the program that makes the most sense. And um, on the left hand side, you see the rebates. It's very easy, like we think it's easy. Um, you know, you go on a web page, your SAM.gov fills out most of the information for you. You put in your bus fleet information, and um, you know, a random number generator will generate a number. You get put in a line with a bunch of random number generated folks. And then the application process goes and picks folks out of that line. Uh, based on priority status, um, it's it's a lot easier. You know, you get you get the the funding. It's you show your um, purchase request form, and then you get the money before you actually have to pay for the bus. So it's sort of like almost like a voucher system. And with this grant program that's open right now, it is a longer, more complicated process. You have to have an application. It's not just a web page. I'm going to get into all this. Like there is a paper application that you're going to fill out that can be up to and usually is 15 pages long. Um, there's additional documentation that goes along with that and I have it all open. I'm going to go through it all as we're here. Um, it's a different different amount of buses that you can apply for and then there's different uh, program parameters with the grants. So it's not going to be for everybody but if you hear me out through this whole program this might be for you. Uh, the other thing is, is that with this grant program as I'm going to get into a school can apply directly, but a third party can apply on behalf of four or more schools. So you may not say, you know, you may not want to directly apply for this grant program, but you may be working with somebody who's a, a, an eligible entity to apply on behalf of your school. So, you know, hopefully some conversations might happen because of this. Um, you know, where folks can maybe coordinate on a third party application. So with all of that little bit of introduction out of the way, I'm gonna get into the most important stuff is the timeline of this program. So the grant application, the grant NOFO application period opened on April 24th, and it's gonna close uh, on August 22nd. I thought it was the 24th, but I guess it's August 22nd. It's going to close at 11.59 p.m. Um, there have been webinar sessions. The first one was on May 10th, and there's a long list of them that I'll show you folks. Uh, and the final date to submit questions for this grant program, because as you're going to see, I can walk through it and talk about it, but I'm not going to be able to answer too many specific questions. And neither can Carter. Uh, you're going to have to go to a, an email box and get an answer from headquarters there. So August 9th is the last day you can ask those questions, but there's plenty of time to do that. Um, and so with this grant program, another difference between this grant and the rebates is that there's gonna be a scoring process. So you're gonna get a number of points based off of what your application contains. Um, we are gonna be reviewing those things for quite some time. So through January, we're gonna be you know, reviewing and selecting these folks. And then by February or March of next year is when you'll actually see funding for this program. Sorry, I'm getting dark and light. My computer is very weird with the auto brightness. Um, so those are your time frames. Like you have until August 22nd to apply for this grant program. And as you see on the bottom of almost every slide, epa.gov slash clean school bus is the web page. And here, let me very quickly, because I have it all open on my screen. Clean school bus is the web page. If you scroll right to this box, right up at the top, and you click learn more about the NOFO, it will take you to the grants page. And so if you keep scrolling, you will find the actual NOFO itself somewhere down here, the CSB Grants NOFO. If you click on that Grants NOFO thing, it'll take you to another page <laughs> where there's the actual PDF. And so it's 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 there. Um, there'll be a lot of information that you can read on your way to getting to that um, NOFO itself. Uh, and let me let me tee up this here. Hey, so Tony, that, you you know, that slide I that I showed up another quick comment. Yeah. Go for it. Oh, yeah, so just wanted, yeah, just wanted to highlight one quick thing. Um, so like Tony had said, there's this 
there's going to be the two different programs, the grant and the rebate. If this is something that's of interest to you and you're thinking about applying for the grant, definitely go into the grant NOFO and read those eligibility requirements of what you need to be uh, in terms of an entity and what the requirements are. The grant is going to be a much more involved process, and it's typically for larger entities that are looking for more buses. So just to save yourself that time before you go through the big process of applying for the grant, make sure you actually qualify and you fit the description of what the grant is looking for under eligibility. Otherwise, that rebate program is going to be a little bit more of a streamlined process that kind of allows a larger variety of entities to come in and apply for those buses. That's right. Carter makes a very good point. And as you can see, I have this, I have the NOFO open. It is 58 pages long. It does behoove you to read all 58 pages thoroughly. Sometimes it takes more than one read, but this is literally, this is the instruction book for applying for. It is almost all the parameters of the grant program. Are, it's all in one giant document. And so who is eligible, what is eligible, how it's eligible, how you can spend it, all that is answered in this NOVO. And so again, like I, we're gonna spend time scrolling through it. I, it behooves you to do that and click on that school bus page and open the NOFO and read it. Um, and again, it is very detailed, um, but it, it all the answers are in there. So, so for this grant, again, it's $400 million. There's two ways to apply, and this is the slide I have up right now. And the left-hand side is the school district sub-program, so a school can apply directly. So if you're a school district and you're one of those eligible entities listed in that first little blue box there, you can apply for between 15 and 50 school buses, so a minimum of 15. Now, the rebate program lets you apply for just one up to 50, and this is a minimum of 15. So that's where, like, you know, you're seeing some distinctions of does this make sense for me? Um, you know, we're looking at large single fleet turnovers that might have been limited, or I'm sorry, by the 25 bus maximum in the rebate program. So, you know, one to 25 for rebates, 15 to 50 for the grants program. And then there's a third party, like I said, if, you know, your school may not be able to handle 15 or you may not need 15 school buses. Um, and so a third party can apply on behalf of at least four schools. And again, you know, the eligible entities are nonprofit school transportation associations, eligible contractors as defined in that RFA. But so between the four schools, you can do one bus, one bus, one bus, and all the rest of the buses, but it has to be a minimum of 25 buses and a maximum of 100 buses. So again, these are looking at larger projects than what you see in the rebate program. And because they're larger, you know, it's gonna take more time, there's more planning involved, and that's why EPA is going with this grants structure. So um, what I wanna show is that there is difference. Um, hold on, let me go back one slide just to make sure. Yep, okay, so there's a little bit of change now. We have been harping on the, the, the infrastructure law tells EPA that we have to prioritize three different groups. We have to prioritize in need schools, rural schools, and tribal schools. And so baked into the, mon the law that gives us the funding, uh, we have to do that prioritization. So there has been a tweak from last year uh, first off, if you look at the high need table here, and I, I made it bold, so it's maybe not the most highlighted thing, but you're looking at 2021 small area income and poverty estimates, so SAPI data. So um, last year we were looking at 2020 SAPI data, now we're looking at 2021 SAPI data, and the numbers have changed a little bit. Um, so I can tell you like in Illinois, Chicago last year is probably the largest public school district in our region and they were at 19.99%. You have to be 20% or more on that SAPI. So they were not a priority school. But now with 2021, uh, they're actually over 20%, which is not good, but you know, for prioritization, you know, it allows the city of Chicago public schools to apply and be a priority school. So check on that. You know, there's a link in the RF in the NOFO to that SAPI data. Check the 2021 data because your school numbers might have changed since last year. The other change for this grants program is because we're looking at larger schools, some schools are unified school districts throughout the whole metropolitan area. And when you shake that out with, um, you know, who's in need and who's not, uh, that 20% threshold school district might be below that 20% threshold. But if your school district has 35,000 students or more, or if there are 45 public schools in the district system or more, you can make a case if you don't have if you don't meet that 20% threshold. School can make a case, and there's a form for that. Um, and let me 
show you really quickly on this grants web page if you scroll down um, there's that self-certification uh, template there and so that would be for schools that are very large they would be able to say hey we do have in need students if you look at a subsection of our of our school district that does meet that threshold now the thing is if you get certified to say hey part of our school district meets that threshold the expectation is the buses that you will be awarded if you do get awarded have to serve that subset so it can't just go anywhere in your school district um, there's one other change and and it's to the rural component and so last year with the rebate program and we don't know what the rebate program is going to look like in the fall but last year with the rebate program there were two types of rural school districts that were considered priority and it was code 42 rural distant and that was schools that were between 5 and 25 miles away from a metropolitan area and then code 43 rural remote which is a school that is 25 miles or more far so they're very far away from rural er from urban areas the 42 schools so between 5 and 25 have been taken out of prioritization for this grant program so only the rural remote school districts are priority and as i'm going to get into here there's a lot of differences unlike the rebate program which says if your priority you know when the selector goes by it's like oh your priority and it pops you out and gives you money this grant program isn't just going to be like oh your priority so you get funded it's going to give you points that go towards a point total so i'm going to get into that um but what i do want to emphasize is it is only the very far away remote schools the in need schools that show 20 percent or more can certify or tribal schools so indian affairs funded school districts or um, schools that receive basic support payments for children who reside on tribal land those will get those points um, let me really quickly on my next slide here you can see this is carter's a good a data whiz in addition to a good state lead and presenter um, so he he and uh, our colleague juan morales have put together a projection of the 20 percent 2021 safety schools tribal schools and the rural uh the code 43 schools, the farthest away schools. So as you could see um, in Indiana, there's not a ton of blue areas. And you know, Illinois, the Southern states in our region have more dense urban areas. And you know, it just, there's fewer priority school districts for this grant program than there were uh, under the 2022 rebate prioritization. So just kind of want to make that um, known, but I will say, I'm going to go back to the web page because I'm jumping around here. It's already, already clicked on it. So the priority school district list is listed on the web page. And if you click on that uh, prioritization list, it will load up um, every school from every state. And if my computer just takes its sweet time to do that, um, you'll be able to go through um, region five and you'll be able to see all the schools in our region if it will ever load. But at any rate, um, the list is out there. And as you can see, I'm just going to go through the ones that are here. But like in Maine, it'll show, you know, all the different schools that are there. And so you can scroll down to your state and find out which ones are in that priority list. Um, let's see here. One last slide. So what you really need to know if you're going to apply for either this grant program, which is very complicated, I'm still going to talk about, or the rebate program in the fall, which is a little simpler, you need to be on SAM.gov. So um, especially if you want to apply for the rebates, Go to SAM.gov right now and make sure that you are registered and active because you have to recertify every year. Um, and you won't be able to apply for the rebates at all unless you have that SAM.gov active. And if you do, then your rebate application is basically pre-populated. And a lot of that information is also able to be pulled from EPA for this grants cycle too. If you're going to apply for the grants, you also have to be um, signed up for and current on grants.gov and that's another federal web page that epa doesn't run and we don't run the sam.gov web page but grants.gov is the page where you're going to upload that application where you submit your grant application so you need to be on both of those pages if you're looking to um you know apply for this grant opportunity so um you know if you, anything you take out of this get on both of those pages at least sam.gov if you want to apply for rebates and grants.gov if you're looking for a grant too and then my last slide is um, like I said kind of early on, Carter and I can't answer very specific questions, 
because you know we are going to be reviewing these applications as they come in and we're, we're not um, you know it's a conflict of interest if we try to do that and we're not trying to favor anybody over anyone else but we do have these forums set up where we can relay overall information if you have a more specific question about something you're going to hear today you should email cleanschoolbus at epa.gov and if you do that you'll get a written response and your question and that response will go in the Q&A document um, and you know if you go to the link that's there that I'm going to go back to on the web page you'll see the Q&A document will be posted there eventually so that I sam.gov grants.gov clean school bus at epa.gov if you take anything away take those three things um, what I want to do really quickly in a very slow fashion is go through the NOFO um, but before I do again this is the main clean school bus web page for the grant um, when you go like I clicked in from the main page you click that little NOFO box and it takes you here um, you scroll down and it again it shows you all your your dates um, the information sessions is on a different web page right now but hopefully that'll be updated in addition to your 15 page application you're going to need to fill out a standard these budget forms the 424 424a and they are standard federal grant budget forms um, and then there's this compliance review and a key contacts form so it's not just going on a web page it's filling out a lot of forms um, there's a sample project narrative um, that i actually do have open um, that you know, I encourage you to go to actually just take the sample narrative and then replace things in it with your own information. Because the sample narrative, as you see here, as I'm going to slowly scroll through it, it's got all the information like, here's your cover page and this is what you should have on the cover page, like your applicant information, your UEI number, you know, your eligibility, check the checkbox or boxes for your eligibility, you need a budget summary, where the project's taking place, you know, describe the air quality and the area where these buses are going to operate, when your project starts and ends, and a short description. So, I mean, there's, there's specific things that need to be in here, and the application has to substantially comply with the NOFO, and this sample document, if you just take it and replace it with your information, you will substantially comply with this NOFO, because it, it's, it's basically your instructions on what to do. Um, so basically, um, if you're a school applying for yourself, you only fill out the first line here. Um, but if you're a third party and you got four or more schools, that's where this has more lines for you to fill out. Um, you know, again, you'll see in this, if, if you're not a third party applicant, you can just delete this portion. Um, the sample is, is very good that way. Um, you're going to have to describe your project summary and approach. So you're going to have to tell a little story about, hey, we have these buses between 15 and 50 or uh, 25 and 100 if we're the multiples you got to describe like you know these buses operate like how they're eligible where they operate how often they operate that you're going to replace them with either EV or propane buses that has to be kind of written out you have to describe outputs and outcomes and so as you can see here and you know there's a lot of information here so I'm not going to read it all but it's basically like by doing this here's the here's the major steps in the process so these are the buses we're going to replace here's the major you know outcomes which would be reducing pollution um you know if your school has like idle reduction programs or other informational programs that you can kind of tack on to and say hey we're going to take this opportunity by replacing these buses to to reiterate to the student population that we have an action plan for our school's you know emissions and, you know we have a plan for our fleet and uh, if you can tie that stuff in there you can you can have more outputs and outcomes so it's like basically like how will this do more than just get you a new bus like what are the other things that'll happen too um there's a performance measures and a plan so you got to say hey by taking this step it's going to get us to the next step it'll get us to the next step which will result in new buses and the old buses either being scrapped or sold or um, donated and you have to have a timeline with some milestones so you got to say by this date we should have this done um you know this Another aspect of grants that I haven't brought up yet is quarterly reporting and a final report. So every quarter you're gonna have to send in a, an Excel sheet with some fleet information and like a narrative, like where are we at? And like, how does this track with the timeline that we made in our application? Um, you're gonna have to wanna talk about uh, the community around where these school buses are operating. And you know, 
again, the prioritization is is such that in need schools, you know, rural schools and tribal schools, you aren't, you're going to want to describe those populations. And you can see here, um, it, you see the link to the SAPI data, the small area income poverty estimates. Um, there's the rural prioritization and tribal prioritization. So you're going to want to tell a story and with information, not just a story. Like you're not going to fabricate anything. You're going to tell the truth. But you're going to tell the story of this is the population of school students, the the population of the parents, and like you know the general population around. This is how they're in need. This is why they would benefit from having cleaner air by having cleaner buses to operating there. Um, let's see here. Yep, you're going to want to list out the prioritization status, because again, you're gonna get extra points if you're in that priority criteria group. Um, you're gonna have to talk about how you have engaged the community, you know, either telling them about like, and this is a tough one because people think like, oh, we, you know, we told the students and they told their parents, that's the community, but you know, that's not necessarily it. If you have public meetings, you wanna put it out there like talking about the program, Maybe you want to get feedback on like which routes make the most sense to use from either an environmental or like a you know just a practical standpoint. But involving your community, the more the merrier. You'll get more points for doing that. Um, let's see here, the project location. So where is this going to take place? And, and another thing is that in the RFA, and I'm gonna I'm gonna flip over again. I'm gonna flip between things, so I apologize for this. Uh, but I want to talk about points. And so I'm going to go back to the NOFO. Um, so in this table of contents, I think it's sort of towards the end. Actually, I'm just going to hard scroll here. Everything in this NOFO will tell you, and it, it all kind of looks the same. Like the language is very similar. So if you're an eligible entity, this looks like the slides. It looks like the sample. It looks like the NOFO because it's all very repetitive information, but necessary information. Um, hold on. So I'm going to scroll down. You get points for meeting more aspects of this NOFO in your application. And let me get there. The total points are 120 points possible. And very few people get all 120 points ever. Like you have to be like the perfect ideal candidate doing the perfect job, you know, making no errors and having every box checked and everything to get 120 points. But there's usually a very close spread of points between the, you know, who gets funded and who doesn't. It's a narrow field, you know, so everybody tries to get as many points as they can. And as you can see in this NOFO, which again, you got to read all 58 pages, but at the bottom of it, page starting at page 46, your total points is 120 points. And, and like I said, if you use that sample narrative and you fill out like that project summary and approach on the first page and like, you know, you tell your little narrative about what's going on in the first few pages, you can get up to 10 points for doing that. Your outputs, outcomes, performance measures, 15 points. So now here's where the priority schools start to come into play. If you're in one of those schools that was in that blue district map that I showed or that's on the web page here, for the, the prioritization list, if you're in one of these priority schools, you will get 20 points because that is the law told us to prioritize the in need, the rural and the tribal schools. So unlike the rebate program where like, oh, you're a priority, we'll pick you out and give you money. In this one, you're gonna get 20 points. And let's see how that shakes out compared to the other, other applications, okay? Um, there is, you can still get five points there by, describing the extent to which you address those communities. If you don't meet the thresholds, you might still have an in need population. Then if you serve that, you can still get some points. The location of this project. So if it's in a non-attainment or maintenance area, and this might be foreign words to folks because EPA, we do we deal with clean air, right? And so we're not usually in the business just buying new vehicles. There's gotta be sort of like a clean air tie-in to this. And so um, areas that, do not meet or previously did not meet or are still maintaining. So there's like the way the Clean Air Act works is like if you have really polluted air, here's the standard how clean it should be. You bring your, your pollution levels down, you have to show how you're gonna meet that standard so you don't go above, right? And it's a 20 year period of, of staying clean. So areas that are either dirty for, for ozone and PM or areas that are in that 20 year staying clean period will get an additional five points. And there is a link on the webpage 
uh, the prioritized, the priority area list, and I've got that on this web page open. It's loading, um, and it will tell you, you know, if you look at the county that you're in. Let me zoom this a little bit. So these are the pollutants that consider, you know, for for particulate matter. There's three different particulate matter standards. And there's two ozone standards. So the thing is, is that like Kern County in, in California, they hit all the boxes, right? They're only going to get five points. So if you get one of these or more, you will get five points in that point criteria. Okay. Um, your past performance. If you've never had a federal grant before, just put we've never had a federal grant. Don't put nothing. Like at least address the topic. And if you at least say something, you can get partial points. But if you had past positive experience in completing federal grants and you can show that, you get 15 points. Okay. The sustainability, like I was talking, it's like, well, you're buying the buses, but how does that tie into other things? Like are there are there programs in the school like climate plans or transportation plans or energy plans? Like how does this tie into a larger scheme of the school? Um you know, journeying to be a cleaner school. Like what What else is there outside of just buying the buses? You can get 10 points for showing how that sustainability is being met. For workforce development, you know, a plan to, because electric buses are different and there's a different set of, you know, maintenance and um, training required to maintain those buses. So um, basically like if you can show how you're gonna meet that and like get your your mechanics up to speed, knowledgeable about it, get points for that too. Showing how your school could be more resilient to climate impacts, get your five points. Now, you're not required to match money. Like you can get, and I'm gonna get into how much money you can get. Um, it's up to $395,000 if you're a priority school for a class seven or eight school bus. And that 395,000 includes the charging too. So you can take however much of that 395, and put it towards the charger, take however much and put towards the bus you're getting 395,000 per bus, okay? But you can leverage money by saying, well, the school or a third party or the state, like it cannot be federal funding, but anything that's not federal funds, you can match those funds and put up, say, hey, you know, we'll, we'll bring in 30% of the cost. And you can get additional points for showing that you will leverage money to make the award go farther. Um, now, the thing is, is that if you get the points for saying you're gonna leverage it and then the money doesn't show up, we could take away the grant because you know you're going to be awarded based off the fact that you those funds are going to be there, right? And so you got the points for that. And if the funds don't show up, then the points don't show up, and we might have picked somebody else. So you know it could affect the legitimacy of the award if you get those points, but then you don't bring that money to the table later. The other thing is is that um, you can you can leverage other things like a utilities you can leverage charging costs like maybe there's someone's going to provide free chargers something like that you can put a monetary cost of that and put that in there so you'll get points for maximizing the federal dollar basically um this this application has to have a budget and it's the last budget category here and for how thorough it's going to be how itemized it will be um, and how much it makes sense, you're gonna get points for that too. And I'm gonna scroll up because that's pretty much our, our scoring breakdown. Um, let me go up to the budget table. And as you can see here, and this this is in the, the NOFO itself, and you'll see it again in the sample narrative, it looks like a budget table. You're gonna have personnel, your fringe benefits, any travel that's relevant to the, getting the grant done. You know, if you had to travel to multiple schools, or maybe you have to go and attend an event to learn more about, or like train your, you know, get a mechanic out somewhere to learn something. Um, and then you're going to have your actual bus costs broken out, and you're going to have this doesn't travel. So you're, you know, the quantity, the cost per unit, your EPA funding, any leverage cost, any applicant cost, and the total cost. So you can see those those top um, category names as I scroll down here. Um, but you want to put for each for each bus that you buy, you know, all the funding where it goes in the right funding box so that these 10 buses are gonna get 2.8 million from EPA, school's gonna put up 350,000, they're gonna leverage 350,000, and it's gonna be 3.5 million um, for those 10 buses. So, you know, the more thorough this budget table is, which it will have to be, um, your vehicles and infrastructure are gonna be broken out, any construction work and equipment upgrades, that's all gonna be broken out, and then you summarize it all at the bottom, um, you know, supplies, contractual, others. This is this is not just going to a web page, and it's not just going there and getting, um, you know, clicking a couple boxes. 
in getting the funding. This is a very long and thorough document, and it is a long and thorough process to be selected and awarded. But the thing is, is with multiple buses, you know, you're going to see more involvement. It, it's they're higher. Um, you know, you're going to be going out for bid for more expensive stuff than just one to you know 25 buses. So, a um, couple more things I want to kind of jump around and talk about. The NOFO lists how much money each EPA region has. And as you saw on the map, EPA Region 5, it's Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. And so EPA Region 5, which is where we're at, we have about $51.6 million for our region. So, you know, we anticipate making maybe five awards for our six states with that $51 million. So there's not going to be a lot of awards. You know, we don't anticipate a ton of applications, but we do anticipate some. And they think it will be competitive. OK, um, and you can see if you have friends or, you know, students in other states that you want them to know how much money is going around. You can see the breakdown region by region, um, you know, at, on page. What is this page 11? We can partially fund. So you may be selected and you might apply for you know, if you're your own school, you apply for 50 buses. And we might come back and say, hey, how about 45? you know, something like that. There's negotiations that can happen. So you may not get all the money you apply for, but you might get some if we negotiate that award. Sorry, I'm getting a little scratchy. I'm gonna go and scroll to how much you can get per bus, because this is also different from last year's rebate program. And it is a single slug of funding. Like I had said, uh, last year we broke it into here's the bus cost and then here's the charging cost and this time you know just sort of hopefully have it be um a little more i don't know the right way to put this epa said we would fund three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars for an electric bus and then all of a sudden like electric buses start costing three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, right and so um in a, in in a desperate bid to help you know tame the cost of these buses and to help uh gosh i'm trying to find this this table and so the other thing too is that last year twenty thousand dollars was is how much you could spend on the charger and sometimes you know if you're getting like a, a level three charger it can cost a lot more than twenty thousand dollars and so that wasn't enough for some folks and so here's the table sorry it took me a while to scroll to it let me zoom in a little bit here just to make it a little more clear so based on your prioritization status, um, and again, like I said, if you are a priority school, so the priority schools are the top row and non-priority schools still get pretty significant funding, but just not as much as if you are priority and get those 20 points. But if you are looking at $395,000 for class seven or class eight electric school bus, and that includes the charging infrastructure. So you can choose how much you want to spend on the bus versus the charger. And you know, again, hopefully, it's like a meager attempt to like not broadcast to the uh, to all the bus companies that hey just charge at 375. So, um, but that that also gives you more flexibility to choose where you want to spend the money. Um, those are some major points. I'm gonna go to a little bit of nitty gritty stuff. And like Carter kind of said in the beginning, there's eligible applicants, there's eligible vehicles and equipment. And this is the last thing I'll talk about before I sort of like open it up a little bit. Um, for and again we can't answer too many specific questions but if there's something you want to know more about i'm happy to kind of scroll to it um so let's see here so you know again eligible schools are school districts it is man let me get to the eligible it was page 13. sorry yeah okay so public school districts one or more local state government entities responsible for providing school bus service to one or more public school systems or state government entities local government entities that have the uh, ability to purchase lease license or contract the service of school buses or a public charter school district that's responsible for those things tribal applicants like i had indicated actual tribes or, or tribes that are funded schools that are substantially funded with tribal funding or have a substantial tribal uh, population and then the nonprofit school transportation associations or eligible contractors and you know this gigantic paragraph at the bottom here describes what an eligible contractor is this time around an eligible contractor this is for the third parties applying so a contractor or a third party you know 
A third party can't apply directly for buses. They have to do it on behalf of four or more schools. Um, the language of the law was amended from the last rebate program to this time. So it does actually include what we normally think of contractors like contracted school bus providers. So this time it does include um, folks that can lease these buses uh, or contract them for service. So um, that is one tweak that is you know pretty good because now it actually, the word contractor fits with the mental picture of contractor that we all have in our heads. Um, but contractor also means uh, manufacturers and vendors too under the under the language of the law. And the buses that you want to apply for, they have to, okay, so here's the eligible existing school buses. So it has to be a school bus, passenger motor vehicle designed to carry a driver and more than 10 passengers that the Secretary of Transportation decides likely to be used significantly to transport students, okay? So if it's 2010 or older, um, that bus, if it's 2010 or older, and you buy the new buses, you're gonna have to destroy the old bus. And that'll involve drilling a hole in the engine block and cutting the frame in half. You can sell the stereo, you can sell the seats, you can sell all the upfit, but that chassis and engine have to go because it's a very, very old bus and it meets very old um, emission standards. If it's a 2011 or newer, you can scrap that bus or you can sell that bus or you can donate that bus. So you don't have to necessarily destroy an old bus, but an old bus will have to be removed from your school service. So you're not expanding your fleet. We are turning it over to a, a cleaner, you know, electric or alt fuel buses fleet. Um, you know, the old buses have to be 10,001 gross vehicle pounds, uh, gross vehicle weight rating or more. They have to be fully operational. They can't just be like on blocks on the front lawn. You know, they gotta be, you have to have used them three times Three days a week on average in the 2022-2023 school year. There are some exceptions if there were COVID related or you know other school closures, but these have to be buses that are used a lot because the idea is that the emissions out of the tailpipe of that bus that's used very often that's older are going to go away or be vastly reduced by replacing that bus with an electric or an alt fuel school bus. Um, and then let's see here. So these replacement buses like I've been alluding to they're either gonna be zero emissions, so they'll be battery electric, or they'll be CNG or propane. At this time, biofuels are not eligible. At this time, um, engine replacement, so you have an existing chassis and you take all the diesel parts off, you put electric ones on, they're not yet eligible for this funding. Head, you know, We've heard, because it is cheaper, uh, it's cost effective. Um, headquarters is working to certify a universe of buses and you know conversion kits that will hopefully soon in the next funding round or after that will soon be eligible. But currently right now you have to purchase a brand new bus and it's got to be electric, CNG or propane. And you know again this it's got to be it's got to be a school bus, got to be 10,001 pounds or more. It doesn't necessarily have to be I think the same class size as the one that you're replacing. So if you know you have a larger bus but you don't have the need to drive that you know, you want to get a smaller bus, you can do that. Um, you know, it can be done. So there is a lot of flexibility there, but you know, this new bus is going to have to be of those three fuel types and it's going to have to serve those students for at least five years. So um, I think, and I'm going to look at Carter to see if I missed any, like there's a lot of stuff and I can keep talking for several more hours, but I know there's probably a lot of questions and things that I might've missed. So I'm going to look at Carter first and then see if anybody has any questions, things that I can go back over, um, any sort of non-specific general questions that we may be able to answer and not have to punt to that clean school bus at epa.gov. So thank you for letting me ramble for a while. Um, again, sam.gov, you wanna be on that if you're gonna apply for any of our school bus funding, either the rebates later this year or the grants that are open now. If you're thinking of applying for a grant, go to grants.gov um, and then, you know, epa.gov slash clean school bus, which will take you to this main page here. And you click on the NOFO and you can learn about all the stuff that I just went over. Um, and I think what I'm going to lastly do is open up our events webpage because there's going to, be, there are a lot of webinars that just aren't listed in that grant page, but they should be. So I'm gonna have them listed out here. And if you go, you can see the, uh, it's a kind of a long, URL for this, but there are 
um, what are we at the 13th? So the 21st through August 30th, you could see these webinars that are gonna be there. Some of them are topical, hitting different topics. So um, hopefully I didn't miss too much and we'll see if we have any questions from folks. And thank you for just letting wanted, me yeah, Go ahead, yeah. Carter. Think, just wanted to think, Tony, that was awesome. I just wanted to add, kind of as I did at the top, if you were looking at that and you were like, whoa, that's a lot of information. Yes, it's quite a dense NOFO, uh, even from standards of just typical NOFOs that we've sent out in the past. So like I said at the top, if this is meant to cater more towards larger school districts and people looking at larger fleets or combined efforts of people applying together, um, and like I said, just make sure you read through that eligibility if you're even considering the grant to make sure this is the right step for you because this is a pretty involved process, not only to apply, but once you get that grant, as Tony was saying, it's a pretty involved process to work with us and have these quarterly reports you're submitting and all this information you're tracking and back and forth communications and financial tracking. Um, so just make sure that that, we'd encourage you to apply if you are eligible, but just make sure you are, because if not, that rebate that will be coming out later this year might be a more appropriate vehicle for you to get funding from us for buses. Yep, and 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 Carter and Carl and Sean and this whole group is basically, you know, we are here to help you make that distinction uh, and to help you, you know, to help get you to that funding source that you can apply for that's best for you. And, and I'm seeing, you know, I uh, want to add to what Carter said with the quarterly reports and all that, these grants, and I did not mention, the expectation is that they're going to be two-year work plans with a, a possibility for a third year. So you're looking at about two or three years to get those new buses in place and to, you know, to get rid of the old buses. You can have them both there at the same time for that two or three year period. By the end of that two or three years, you'll have new buses and the old ones will be um, you know, either scrapped or sold or donated. Um, and then, let's see here, I'm looking at supply. Can, yeah, that that does, it. you know, if three years from now, there's still supply chain issues, I think we'll be dealing with that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, hopefully there won't be. Hopefully three years is enough time, but we'll see. Um, so yeah, I think Carl, are you gonna see it? Yeah, there, Tony, I don't know if you read the second question about the- um, Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Um, well, okay, so, I, you know, that is a different sort of topic about the lithium. I think that, you know, that's a good topic of discussion for another call for us to have, uh, would be the environmental impact of transportation in general, you know, and so I, I would remind folks that, <laughs> you know, any goods and service that we have, even the diesel engines and equipment that there's a lot of out there already, like everything takes resources. Um, you know, I, I'm not an expert on the, you know, the the battery components and that. What I will say is actually we, there is a lady who is an expert, uh, Dr. Anna Stephanopoulou, and she's going to be speaking at our EPA meeting next month that I think that um, Drive Clean Indiana will send out links for. And um, it is July 13th is going to be the day where we're going to be talking all about school buses. And she works at the University of Michigan Battery Laboratory. So she can talk about, you know, the components of batteries and the raw materials that go into them in addition to, and I'm trying to see if I can move and get myself bright again, in addition to, um, you know, the life cycle of those batteries and larger environmental issues around them. So that is unfortunately something I don't have a lot of yeah, knowledge Tony, about. What we'll try to you know. do is um, get someone from Argonne also uh, to maybe on our next uh, webinar, we can have them kind of go over the life cycle and some of the new technologies that are coming out with batteries. Um, so that I think yeah. that's a point that we can, we can discuss that on our next Indiana Clean School Bus. Uh, consortium uh, meeting. We'll, we'll we'll see if we can get an expert to uh, kind of give us all uh, a little education on this and what we're working on uh, throughout the United States. So we'll work on that. Yes. The one thing I will say is based off of hearing her presentation a couple months ago at our uh, fuel laboratory in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, it was, they I think they did work with Argon and they're looking at life cycle, you know, emissions of all transportation vehicles. And, you know, the thing that kind of struck me is that you have a lot of folks saying, oh, you know, 
the emissions from the electric vehicles are huge at the production phase, they are greater than diesel and gasoline manufacturing, but the vast majority of the emissions and the vast majority of extra emissions from combustion engines compared to electric vehicles, combustion engines vastly emit more pollution at the running the engine phase. And so when you look at like the, the giant bar, like you have a diesel engine, its life of emissions is here. And you have an EV and it might be, you know, its emissions are here and they're from the, you know, from the coal fire power plant and manufacturing. When you look at the manufacturing bit of that whole bar chart, and you zoom that in, and it's a very small part of like the life of that vehicle. And you zoom into the electric, and the you know the electric is maybe about here compared to diesel. And you'll see this in the July thing. So yeah, there is a little bit more, but when you're looking at the whole life cycle, the vast majority is lighting fuel on fire in a, in a combustion chamber and having that exhaust come out of a tailpipe. So I mean, yes, there are, but the vast majority of it comes from the tailpipe. Okay, so, um, um, why don't we uh, move like on <laughs> to uh, consideration yeah. of time. It's uh, We've got about nine minutes left. Um, so uh, please continue to type in your questions in the chat. And then I would like to now introduce Ryan Lissick from Drive Clean Indiana. He's going to talk a little bit about grant applications and potentially how we can assist. Thank you, Carter. Thank you, Tony. But again, please continue to um, type in your messages, in your questions into the chat. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. So, as it relates to school buses, Drive Clean Indiana, a 501c3 nonprofit, has been very successful in managing a variety of different grants related to school bus funding. Um, and in the last five years alone, we have gotten um, quite a bit of school buses, over 300 school buses that are propane, diesel, and electric deployed across the state of Indiana. And we want to be your partner for anything that's going on related to electric or propane school buses here in the state. And we can be your guiding star, your expert consultant in all of this. There is This is a heavy lift, especially for a lot of the school district transportation directors who are not only working on the administrative side but also driving school buses and now is the perfect time for us to really partner on on a statewide application is what we're looking at doing and working with a variety of different schools from across the state to submit one indiana clean school bus consortium application and we will help out across the board on the reporting um, on the back end, the scrappage of equipment, we would definitely want to start working right away um, and start scheduling some meetings. And we can come down and meet you in person and talk to all of the different uh, decision makers that are in your uh, cabinet, if you will. And being able to go to the, the board, the school board, being able to talk to the superintendents that is something that we can help with. Additionally, as part of this application, you need to have a conversation and a role with your local electricity, electric utility, if you're looking at electric school buses, and that is something that we can definitely hold your hand through this whole way. And so just jumping right in here, the first thing to do, schedule a meeting with Drive Clean Indiana. We're the only Department of Energy Clean Cities Coalition within the state. These applications are, are set up very much similar to a national DARA application. The, the last time national DARA applications were out was in 2021. And in EPA Region 5, there was 30 applications and there was only four awards. Drive Clean Indiana received two of those four awards. We also received a, a application for Connecticut project as well. But we have, we have the sheets, the Excel spreadsheets to break down this uh, process across the board and be able to conceptualize, analyze costs, work with your local vendors and who you wanna work with. We do not have a 
uh, third party or we have our own agenda, we only want to work with folks that you want to work with. And there's a lot of misinformation that is about um, coming from third party out of state folks. Now is the time to really go after this funding and have it benefit your school district. And across the board, we are able to do this and make it easy for everyone that we would be working with. Um, we're able to leverage a variety of different funding opportunities with this. And we've been able to do that in the past where for one opportunity, they only had to, it was less than 10% of the total cost of two electric buses and infrastructure for one of the schools that we worked with. Um, for one of the clean school bus rebates in 2022, we were able to secure $110,000 more funding for the charging stations. If you wanna look at what your uh, fleet emissions are, we have the Green Fleet Program where we literally use EPA calculators and Department of Energy calculators to look at your emission baseline and, and recommend opportunities as far as what is the most beneficial type of fuel for your fleet. We have all this at our disposal. We've been doing it for a long time. We're not a fly-by-night company and we're local. We can be your guiding star through all this, just like I said before. However, it's summer. There's a lot of things that happen in summer. You want to go out, we have vacations and so on and so forth. I have a baby that's due any week now. We need to start getting together and having the conversation now. We would like to have everything uh, buttoned up before July 15th. In addition, there's some SAM.gov administration issues that we can be a service on if your school is not already registered. Um, but this is a long program and it is a great opportunity. I can't deny that. And we can be very successful in all this, but it's gonna be competitive. And we feel that we have a competitive edge with some of our relationships and some of our uh, tricks up the sleeve related to a grant application. So we can bring those partners to you and at the end of the day, we keep it simple, we keep it easy. So hit the easy button and schedule a meeting with us. And you can call me directly, reach out to me directly. My information's in the slide, but we've been very successful. And there's a lot of, lot of things that, all that are considered in this application, but we can work through them all with your school and have your school be the beneficiary. Well, thank you, Ryan. Um, why don't you go to the next slide? So, uh, you know, a couple ideas uh, that are available to you. And again, the, this uh, um, working across the state uh, as the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, we have a variety of uh, opportunities for schools and organizations to become part of our uh, team. So uh, just some opportunities uh, for your school and your school districts. Uh, next slide, please. And if you have questions, again, I, I think uh, utilizing us, utilizing the state, utilizing um, the Indiana Department of Education, and then obviously utilizing US EPA as our source of information, we are bundled collectively uh, together. Do you need to work with us? No, um, you can do this by yourself. Uh, we are trying to supply this information, but like Brian said, it's our goal is to make Indiana schools and school districts uh, our priority areas the cleanest that they can be. And that's uh, to be very self-serving, very selfish. Uh, that's for all of us and for our kids. So uh, next slide, please. So again, other upcoming events that we have uh, will be on August 8th. Uh, will be our next Indiana Clean School Bus Consortium. As we uh, alluded to, we will have uh, someone speaking about the life cycle costs of uh, and life cycle uh, analysis and uh, battery technology update. And we will uh, we will have that uh, on our agenda for the next uh, meeting, which will be August 8th. We will not be having a meeting in July because of vacations and because of um, you know, a lot of our, our school districts that we have been working with, we know that potentially they might not be working. And just some of the upcoming events that we do have. Uh, just to remind all the schools, the Student Transportation Association of Indiana will be taking place in Westfield, Indiana on June 26. Um, as we just talked about the Clean School Bus webinar, our annual uh, technology conference and expo will be held 
in August uh, August 23rd. Uh, that's after the due date uh, of the uh, clean school bus grants. And then we've got a clean air golf outing. And then we've also got a, uh, a various uh, EV boot camps that we're gonna be conducting uh, across the state. So again, I just wanted to thank everyone for being on today. If you have any questions, uh, concerns, comments, uh, please take a minute and complete the, uh, the survey. And again, if there's things that you want to know that maybe we have not covered yet to date and that you would like on upcoming webinars or additional information on various uh, uh, projects and programs, please uh, reach out to us. So again, if you would just take the moment, uh, complete the survey, and we wanted to say thank you to Carter and to Tony for being on. A lot of information, but it's an exciting time, and we just look forward to seeing everybody uh, very shortly. And again, please feel free to reach out to any of us at Drive Clean Indiana with any of your questions. So uh, on that note, I don't see any more questions in the, uh, the chat. But we actually you. do have one. We have one. Um, it says, will this be a set-aside opportunity for businesses that are consulting or business development that can tie in a different school district, or is this set in place for the districts? Um, I Okay, so for the... I think the answer is that a business would have to... Like if it's like a you know chamber of commerce or something like they they wouldn't necessarily meet that eligibility criteria, so they may want to, you know. I would shoot an email to to clean school bus at epa.gov and say what are the opportunities under the budget for a group like this business that would want to you know, are there ways that funds can be used for this business to help promote the program if they're awarded you know to like reach out to schools i think i think unfortunately you know a private company that isn't an eligible contractor like that isn't you know a manufacturer or a vendor or a contracted school bus provider like they're not going to be able to apply on behalf of that and so I, it's it's just i'm sort of racking my brain on finding a, a, a way that would fit that wouldn't involve asking the clean school bus folks. So I apologize, I don't totally have an answer there. All right, thank you, Tony. And again, I just wanna thank everyone for being on. Uh, we just went over our time allotment. So thank you everyone for uh, taking a bit of time out of your day. And we look forward to seeing everybody in August for our next webinar on the Indiana Clean School Bus Consortium. Have a great week. Thank you, Carl.